Hello, I'm Peter. Thanks for joining me as I talk about the genetic evidence for interbreeding between Neanderthals and our own species, Homo sapiens. If you enjoy my content, please make sure to like and subscribe. Thanks. Homo neanderthalensis is the scientific name for an extinct group of humans who once lived throughout Europe and much of Asia, and often we'll just call them the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals are particularly interesting because not only do we have fossils of hundreds of different individuals, we've also been able to sequence their genome. That's right, by extracting DNA from their bones and sequencing it, we're now able to compare the genome of this extinct group of humans to our own to better understand the similarities and differences and also the evidence for interbreeding. Now, first of all, I should run you down on a couple details that we know about Neanderthal DNA. First, we know that Neanderthals shared 99.7% of their DNA with us, which is a lot. We share quite a bit of DNA. But modern humans alive today all share 99.999% of our DNA with each other. So you are only like 0.0001% different from any other Homo sapiens individual. And when we look at it through that lens, what we see is that Neanderthals actually had a substantial difference from us, right? That 0.3% is pretty substantial given how similar we all are to each other today. Fascinatingly, when we look at these variable sections of the genome called alleles, it turns out that we have these specific sequences that we inherited from Neanderthals. That is, if you don't live in Africa, because interestingly, Africans do not have Neanderthal DNA, for the most part, in their genome. Why is that? Well, Neanderthals never lived in Africa. They lived in Europe and the Middle East, and therefore, the people who lived in Africa never really interbred with Neanderthals. But we, who are of either European or Asian descent, it turns out, have Neanderthal DNA in us because our ancient Homo sapiens ancestors interbred with members of the species Homo neanderthalensis, which is pretty fascinating if you think about it. Go far enough back on your family tree and you are the descendant of a Neanderthal. Now interestingly, from all of these snippets of Neanderthal DNA in our genome, we can reconstruct about 20% of the entire Neanderthal genome but there's parts that we can't find in our own DNA. How do we know those parts exist? Once again, because we've actually sequenced their whole genome from the bones that we found. And so we can compare these portions to those which actually came from Neanderthals and compare them and see they line up. On a short side note here, the absence of Neanderthal DNA in Africans may support the view that Homo sapiens first originated on the continent of Africa. Why exactly is that? Well, if modern humans had originated in either Europe or in Asia or the Middle East, they would have been in contact with Neanderthals and we would have expected them to have been interbreeding. But if they had gone from locations where they were living with Neanderthals to Africa, they would have carried the genetic heritage of those Neanderthals with them when they inhabited Africa. But instead what we see is that the people who live in Africa do not have this Neanderthal DNA with them. And it seems instead that Homo sapiens came out of Africa and inhabited these other regions. And now, I'm not particularly certain that Homo sapiens originated in Africa, but I think that is an interesting piece of evidence which may support that view. So besides telling us that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens interbred, what can the genome really inform us about? A very interesting paper came out by Sankara Raman et al. in 2014, and it was called The Landscape of Neanderthal Ancestry in Present Day Humans. This paper is intriguing because it goes beyond just the assertion that Neanderthals and modern humans interbred. It actually indicates some of the specific ways in which the Neanderthal DNA which we've inherited actually affects us, either for good or bad. Although up to 4% of our DNA can be sourced from Neanderthals, it isn't all found in like a big chunk somewhere in our DNA. It's all broken up in small pieces throughout our chromosomes. The upper limit for a single sequence is about 100,000 base pairs. And a base pair is just one of those amino acids 
on the DNA, like guanine, cytosine, thymine, or adenine, and they make up your genetic code, right? And so uh, about a hundred thousands of those in length is the maximum length of a Neanderthal sequence in our genome. Throughout your genome are these specific locations called alleles, which is a place on one of your chromosomes where the specific sequence of acids is variable. That means from person to person you can have a different sequence there. But there are some sequences which come from Neanderthals, and so when we look we can identify which people have the Neanderthal sequence at that specific location on the chromosome. And it turns out that when we look at certain functional alleles, we can find Neanderthal DNA. Interestingly, specifically in genes that affect the development of things like hair and nails, what we find is that there is a very high frequency of base pairs that have come from Neanderthals. And what that tells us is that there is some sort of reason why exactly our genome is selecting for that. A large amount of people have that section compared to other parts of the Neanderthal genome. And that indicates that it is being selected for. There's a particular biomolecular reason why exactly a larger number of people end up having this particular sequence. These researchers suggested that before Homo sapiens made it to more northerly latitudes, Neanderthals had already adapted to the climate there. And as a result, when they interbred with Homo sapiens, they passed on some of these traits that are adaptations to the cold climate. And as a result, they played a functional role and therefore were selected for in the Homo sapiens population. But not all the genetic material which we inherited from Neanderthals is good for us. In fact, there seems to be a link between some of these Neanderthal alleles and diseases like lupus, Crohn's disease, and type 2 diabetes. There's, interestingly, other parts of the genome in which we find very little Neanderthal ancestry, and these are referred to as deserts. When we look at them, we can go for millions of base pairs and not find any sequences that come from Neanderthals. And this is really interesting. Why are there certain parts of the genome where we find a high concentration of Neanderthal ancestry and certain parts where we find a very low concentration? We can pretty easily explain areas of our genome which are high in Neanderthal ancestry. They're most likely just the result of certain alleles that we inherited from them that were beneficial to us. And those that didn't have them perhaps died out because they were so beneficial to our population. But what do we do with those areas where there are deserts, where we don't have any Neanderthal ancestry? There's two possibilities. One possibility is that those regions were very damaging to us, and so people who had them were selected against in the environment, and therefore people who had those genetic lineages went extinct. Or possibly another solution is that we never inherited those sequences from Neanderthals because of hybrid sterility. The study noted this, the largest deserts of Neanderthal ancestry are on chromosome X, where the mean Neanderthal ancestry is about a fifth of the autosomes. This is really cool because it turns out to line up with something called Haldane's rule, which is basically the observation that when we look at animal species that hybridize and have problems producing fertile offsprings, usually those problems lie with the fertility of males, specifically. And when we look at the males, it turns out that a lot of the issues which cause fertility map directly to the X chromosome. The researchers of this study decided to look into that deeper, and they looked at these specific parts of the genome which they called tissue-specific genes. And these genes are basically expressed within a particular part of the body. And what they found when they looked at a variety of different tissues is that those which were expressed in the testes were those which lacked the most Neanderthal DNA. A couple years later, in 2016, a paper by Mendez et al. entitled The Divergence of Neanderthal and Modern Human Y Chromosomes discussed the Neanderthal Y chromosome. And it turns out that we don't have the Neanderthal Y chromosome. Uh, they've never observed portions of Neanderthal DNA in the Y chromosome of modern men. 
which is very, very interesting. And they actually looked at some of these specific genes on the Y chromosome and where Neanderthals differed from modern humans. One specific gene which they looked at was KDM5D, and they say that it is responsible for the production of male-specific histocompatibility antigens. And for you who didn't get that the first time, an antigen is basically just a structure in your cell which observes foreign bodies and then invokes an immune response trying to basically attack it. And what is odd here is that these specific genes seem to have caused problems in reproduction. That is that, as the paper says, that we have invoked a maternal immune response. In other words, the mother would have sensed these and then attacked basically the baby. Her immune system would have thought the baby was a foreign object to be attacked and basically would have resulted in a miscarriage, which is very fascinating, also sad, and it indicates that there might have been some reproductive incompatibility between Neanderthals and humans. A possible explanation for the DNA which we share and also don't share with Neanderthals was raised by Mason and Short in 2011. Their paper was entitled Neanderthal Human Hybrids. They noted that modern humans and Neanderthals also don't share the mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA is separate from the rest of the DNA which you have, which is stored in the nucleus in the center of your cell. The mitochondria is this little organelle in your cell, which basically produces energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate, which powers your cell. But inside of the mitochondria, there's a little loop of DNA. And it turns out that this DNA is inherited from the maternal lineage. So I have my mother's, basically a copy of her mitochondrial DNA. But interestingly, we do not have the mitochondrial DNA of Neanderthals. Once again, this region where we have a desert. No Neanderthal ancestry. Mason and Short explain our observations in this way. The available data leads to the hypothesis that only male Neanderthals were able to mate with female humans. So this obviously can explain why exactly modern humans do not have Neanderthal DNA in our mitochondria. But what about our Y chromosome? They go on to say, if Haldane's law applied to the progeny of Neanderthals and humans, then female hybrids would survive, but male hybrids would be absent, rare, or sterile. Interbreeding between male Neanderthals and female humans as the only possible scenario accounts for the presence of Neanderthal nuclear DNA, the scarcity of Neanderthal Y-linked genes, and the lack of mitochondrial DNA in modern human populations. Another possibility is that even though Homo sapiens and Neanderthals interbred and produced fertile offspring who had mitochondrial DNA and the Neanderthal Y chromosome, that there was simply some sort of force which selected against the Neanderthal components, even though the individual hybrids themselves may have been fertile. Harrison Nielsen published a paper in 2016 entitled The Genetic Cost of Neanderthal Introgression. They once again attempted to model interactions between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. And what I think is especially interesting about their particular results is that they came to the conclusion that there would have been strong selection against hybrids between humans, modern humans that is, and Neanderthals, and that this may have basically limited down the amount of Neanderthal DNA which was passed on to later generations. And why exactly would there have been this selection? Well, they suppose that because Neanderthals lived in smaller populations, they would have accumulated more mutations, had a higher mutation load, and thus would have been less fit than modern humans, and therefore they were selected against, and their highly mutated sequences were selected against in hybrids. Although this is an interesting hypothesis, I don't think it explains the data as well as some of the other hypotheses which we have. Why is that? Well, because it doesn't really explain why exactly we would have Neanderthal deserts in the first place, or why they followed such a specific pattern. That is, if Neanderthals have just a general you know, mutational load, why is it that it's in these specific locations predicted by some of the other hypotheses? In fact, the authors noted this and had to deal with it by certain interactions, which they basically chalked it up to negative epistatic interactions, but I think that this is probably a less likely scenario 
than some of the others which have been proposed. And that's where I think I'll wrap things up. We've looked at a lot of different data points and also different hypotheses which have been proposed to explain the data. So let me give you some of my thoughts. First of all, I think that these deserts of Neanderthal ancestry are probably very important for telling us something specific about this interaction between our two species. And I think they are probably best explained by some sort of reproductive incompatibility between you know, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. And I think in addition, there was probably selection against Neanderthal DNA in parts of the genome as well. Kind of a merging of these two hypotheses, probably a little bit of truth in both of them. So overall, what we then can come to understand is that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens may very well have been reproductively incompatible in certain patterns. And perhaps only male Neanderthals were able to breed and produce fertile offspring with female Homo sapiens. This is a fascinating topic and I hope to continue researching in it because it has a number of important implications for me as a young earth creationist especially. Obviously those who believe in an older have a very large time frame in which to fit human history and the selection against Neanderthal hybrids over long amounts of time. But I think that incompatibility between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens together with strong selection against Neanderthal sequences could possibly be an explanation for why exactly we only see a small amount of Neanderthal DNA in modern populations, even though it's been only a short time, uh, you know, from a creationist perspective, since our ancestors interbred with them. Thanks for listening. I hope you learned a little bit about the science of interbreeding between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. If you enjoyed, please leave a like. Thanks for watching.